welcome to Protect, Suicide Prevention Training Podcast for Healthcare Professionals. I'm Manan, Consultant Psychiatrist, Founder and Head of Faculty at Progress Guide. Hi, I'm Mahi, your host for Episode 4, Using the Compass. Manan, the four care quadrants of the care compass that you outlined in the previous episode builds nicely on the nautical metaphor of navigating rocky waters. One can use it to conceptualize and understand recovery and the various pitfalls in the context of suicidal distress. But will you actually use this theoretical framework in delivering clinical care? In short, yes. Developing a person-centered care package involves considering the person's history, current presentation, and most importantly, what the person defines as a life that is meaningful to them. This information can be projected onto the compass from the point of view of the person in distress, their family, and the professionals. It captures where the person is now and where they are headed and provides the promise of recovery. It is a visual map or a prop for some key conversations like capturing hope, understanding risk and safety, resolving differences of opinion. So how will you use the care compass to capture hope? Safety is the first priority in a suicidal crisis, and it often entails the loss of personal freedoms. Feeling that the locus of control is no longer within one's sphere of influence engenders a sense of helplessness and may perpetuate suicidal feelings. This is not uncommon on an inpatient ward. To mitigate this inherent risk in life-preserving actions, The care compass can be used to explain that even in the most restrictive of settings, there are some decisions that the person can make or is making. These decisions might not seem much and generally relate to how they engage with the treatment on offer. Affirming and plotting on the care compass all positive steps taken by the person in the midst of a crisis serves as a visual reminder that in small but definitive ways they are influencing the course of events. While receiving prudent care, capturing and feeding back the choices they have exercised support the rediscovery of hope and self-belief. This can be done really easily with the visual prop which the care compass is. I suppose both hope and self-belief are crucial in mitigating risk and enhancing safety. Is that what you meant when you said the care compass can be used to understand risk and safety? Yes, an extension of capturing hope is an informed discussion on why it is important to strike a balance between risk-taking and the current resilience of the person. Using the transition from prudent care to the remaining three care quadrants, professionals can explain to the person and their families different kinds of risk-taking processes. An honest attempt in helping the person understand the thinking behind the different approaches. Say, for example, clinically, what is risk-prone or what is risk-averse? And what is the balance between the two, which we normally describe as positive risks? This may help them see that what they might consider restrictive and describe as risk-averse may be risk-prone in the professional's mind, and vice versa in other situations. Explanations of how the treating team are trying to strike a balance between maintaining safety and letting go generally go down well. This brings them on board for the journey ahead. I can see what you mean by using the care compass to resolve differences. Will you use the care compass to establish how the person themselves believe they are tracking? Absolutely. And if there is a clear difference of opinion between the treating team and the person or support network, the care quadrants and the associated risk-taking approaches can be sensitively explored to establish a middle ground. For example, an individual might feel ready for discharge, but the treating team might consider this premature. Following the care quadrant discussion, a safe compromise might be reached in which the family take responsibility to mitigate risks for a day leave trial. If successful, this could be followed by overnight leave. The compass provides a direction around which shared decision making can crystallize, returning the locus of control to the person and guiding future recovery. In prudent care, the person is extremely fragile, so positive risks will be small and supervised in nature. With improving resilience, the risks might appear bigger 
but are in keeping with the same principle of appropriateness. The converse difference of opinion might also arise. For example, a person may not feel ready to step down into primary care, but the community case manager might feel they are ready. Using the care compass, the trajectory they have taken together could be explored. This would often highlight the source of anxiety, making it easier to mitigate. It might involve revisiting the relapse prevention plan, close liaison with the general practitioner, family coming on board, and an agreement for rapid reaccess in the first six months. Shared decisions around positive risk support the desired direction of the compass, from the bottom left of prudent care to the top right of permissive care. When a difference of opinion creeps up, a genuine, honest, empathic attempt to communicate and support the person and their natural circle of support to take ownership of maintaining safety and working towards self-reliance will resolve the dissonance. In terms of constructing a therapeutic alliance, the discussions that precede the shared decision are as important, if not more, than the decision itself. So the care compass can be used to capture hope, provide a better understanding of risk and safety, and to find common ground when there is a difference of opinion. Are there any other uses of the care compass? That is a really interesting question. I believe that the care compass can be used to address entrenched culture. The care compass can assist in the mindset shift, helping us move from what's the matter with you to what matters to you. Rarely would someone be tipped into suicidal distress over something that does not matter to them. In qualitative studies that we have conducted, the importance of knowing the person being supported has been repeatedly highlighted by participants. The Care Compass could be a vital tool to bring about this mindset shift, moving from what's the matter with you to what matters to you. Practitioners move from a deficits-based approach of fixing people to an assets-based one of re-enabling. It requires practitioners to move from top to tap and travel with the person. When setting and delivering treatment goals in prudent care, systematically understanding and addressing what matters to the person will mitigate the dynamic fluctuations and risks that are often missed. Given the issues that are being addressed are important to the person, there will be greater engagement. Safety is an automatic consequence. The same can be said of permissive care when engagement with the recovery journey can be considerably enhanced if issues that are meaningful to the person are addressed. Navigating the hearts and minds is important to support anyone with mental health challenges, but is particularly so in the person who views suicide as a solution to unbearable psychological pain. Are there successful examples of such culture change in terms of less restrictive care or positive risk-taking? Yes, there are. As mentioned in Episode 1, many of the PROTECT tools, including the Care Compass, has been modelled on the practice and learnings within the 333 inpatient setting in Cambridgeshire, UK. So from the UK, national benchmarking data from 2016 showed that the mean proportion of patients admitted involuntarily was 35.1% nationally. This compared to 19.1% within Cambridgeshire and Peterborough NHS Foundation Trust. The success in delivering care in partnership and in the least restrictive setting has been replicated at the Princess Alexandra Hospital, Brisbane, Australia, where emergency department mental health staff who have been using one of the tools called the 127 Safety Conversation. We talk about this later in the Aspire module. Within that conceptual framework of Care Compass have successfully reduced admission rates. They have dropped from a high of 27.9% of emergency department attendances pre-training in 2019 to a low of 16.5% post-training in 2020. We are in the midst of publishing this data at the moment. The Care Compass helps conceptualize where the current crisis sits within the larger context of the recovery journey. This, when shared with the person in distress and their loved ones, generates hope and the belief that things will get better. Although we cannot conclusively claim 
that the decrease in admission rates is due to staff's better understanding of the balance between risk and recovery, we believe that the conceptual framework of Care Compass supports positive risk-taking in professionals. Like the other dichotomies laid out before, safety and self-reliance are two sides of the same coin. Using the Care Compass, the professional can seek resonance in the seemingly dissonant positions of life and death, risk and recovery, care and control. The conceptual underpinning of recovery-oriented care in the Care Compass is essential to form the partnership needed for the journey ahead, the journey from pain to pain relief. So far, a lot of the examples and the narrative is around inpatient care or care in an emergency. However, most of the recovery journey for people is in the community. How will you use the Care Compass to discuss and describe some of the hurdles to recovery in the community? In order to understand this, it is really important to look at the diagram. All graphics, media, and transcripts are available at www.progress.guide forward slash blog. Navigate to episode four and look at the figure titled Mind the Gap. I'll do my best to describe it, but it is so much easier when you are looking at it. So the Care Compass has not been designed to be operationalized in a concrete way. But theoretically, you can map the y-axis of safety and self-reliance onto the different teams a person may encounter on their recovery journey. So the minus 5N, where the focus is primarily on safety, would then correlate to inpatient care. So if you are tracking upwards from the minus 5N to the plus 5N, one may transition into intensive home treatment. It's called differently in different parts of the world, like crisis resolution and home treatment teams in the UK, acute care team uh, in Australia. And, and that transition would happen, say, around minus 2, which gives way to continuing community care at plus 1. And finally, back into primary care, in GP land, say at the plus 5N, where the person is completely self-reliant. The x-axis could represent the passage of time, minus 5 being the time of initial presentation in suicidal crisis, and then the person gradually convalesces, becomes increasingly more resilient as they approach the plus 5N. If this is the case, the person's recovery journey represented in the diagram Mind the Gap by the red arrow, should go from the bottom left to the top right. Secondary care professionals, represented by the blue arrow in the diagram, will track along with the person, with their role gradually receding and seizing all together when the person transitions into primary care. Of course, no one's recovery journey is a straight line and there will be ups and downs. So almost that wavy line that you see in the diagram, that is what the recovery journey would look like. However, in broad terms, this is what recovery ought to look like, a journey from the lighthouse on the shore where prudent care is delivered to the open waters of permissive care with the person at the helm steering through the challenges that life brings forth. However, on this recovery journey, Many hit the ceiling of expectation that care providers have for them. For the purpose of graphical representation, in the diagram we have put the marker down around fortnightly appointments with the case manager. So instead of progression towards primary care, the person gets stuck in the secondary care system with repeat appointments. The reasons are similar to those outlined in prescriptive care. But irrespective of what causes it, there is a gradual erosion of self-belief and increasing reliance on the professional and services. In time, the professional trajectory of fortnightly review begins to change the expectations the person living with mental health challenges has of themselves. They no longer have the confidence to sail solo and progress to the top right corner, which would be the plus five, plus five end of the care compass. Instead, they begin to track the professional trajectory of needing to be seen once every fortnight. Care providers often justify their presence in the person's life under the title of maintenance treatment, 
But in reality, this is what illness saturation and dependence looks like. This can be witnessed in inpatient settings too, with people getting stuck in the prescriptive care quadrant. Most professionals will recall some patients where the lack of confidence in safely managing care in the community has resulted in prescriptive care on a psychiatric ward and an endless battle between the services and the person. This is often seen in people with severe and complex borderline personality disorder, where opinions can be extremely divergent as to what is in the person's best interest. However, generally because of the pressure on beds, professionals are quite mindful of striking a balance between risk and recovery on inpatient wards. But this can be easily overlooked in community care. The person's journey in the community should have been upwards and onwards not just sideways. If services do not mindfully monitor their risk-taking threshold in the community, they will have to deal with the missed opportunity of the person becoming self-reliant and an expert in the management of their condition, represented diagrammatically by that green arrow. The sad truth is that the gap between where the person should have been and where they end up is an ever-increasing gap. Where the person ends up, is an iatrogenic effect of services failing to let go in a safe, effective and timely fashion. The longer professionals hold on after their work is done, the longer the gap becomes. It keeps growing with time. So let me see if I've got this correct. You were suggesting that the care compass can be used to constructively review and challenge one's own practice, or it can be used as a reflective tool within a peer group of mental health professionals. One may be genuinely concerned about the well-being of the person they're supporting in the community. However, unknowingly, they may be creating dependence and the community version of institutionalization. In your opinion, reflective practice using the care compass can help mine the gap between what a person can be and what they might become if we do not let go in a timely fashion. That is spot on. The care compass will help strike this balance between risk and recovery. Without risk, there is no recovery. With the right care, the person has more control. Thank you for listening. If you have found this episode helpful, do share it with colleagues who might benefit from a deeper understanding of assets-based recovery-oriented care using the Care Compass.